Thank you for coming. I'm going to give this talk in English, as uh, shown in the program. Um, we are going to have a look at how you can automate your home using Python and Python tools. Uh, well, let's go right into it. Why would you want to automate your home? You have a light switch on the wall, it was perfectly fine, but it was not always that way, and it will change over time. So uh, when they first installed Edison Electric Lights, they had this kind of sign that showed everyone how to light the lights. Um, so home automation goes further than this. We have actuators that run our systems everywhere. The uh, street lights are controlled by automatic systems. The traffic lights are contro controlled by automatic systems. And why not do it at home as well? So home automation is fun, and we can do it. So why not? Uh, we want to make switching things great again. And <laughs> And we want to connect, connect our things together. So stuff that doesn't uh, know about uh, each other can be turned into a smart solution that does something you uh, would have to do manually, and now you can do it automatically. And of course, we can automate stuff. So stuff that you always do and that your home uh, senses, you can automatically trigger and make your life easier. So for me, it all started with this. You have a cheap wall plug that you bought in a hardware store, and you try to switch the light behind it. And it makes life easier in the sense that you don't have to buck down in every corner of your room to turn, all on, all, turn on all the lights. And well, if this remote can switch it, then you certainly can switch it with something you solder together yourself. And that's what I did. I sold out one of these remotes to an Arduino and programmed it to, to switch basically the lights. Uh, it replicated the commands that the RF plug used. And I connected it with an Ethernet shield. Well, it kind of worked. It was not the uh, best solution. It had a uh, web interface only, and you could not anymore control it via any uh, wall switch, which is kind of un unpractical. Uh, and you have to train every person that comes in the house to how to use the website and how to use your <laughs> phone to switch the lights. That's not something you want to do. And additionally, Arduino code is not Python. We want you to use Python. So there's a solution for that. It's called MicroPython. MicroPython is a Python distribution that is optimized for running on microcontrollers. So you can flash a teeny tiny little microchip with a Python environment, uh, and it runs your Python code. It was a Kickstarter by Damian George in 2014. He implemented. Python 3 to run on microcontrollers. It's open source hardware and software. Um, the first device was an ARM chip uh, with 192 megabytes of RAM, which is rather big. Um, it has about 40 GPIO pins. Um, it is a rather fast CPU, which you would find in cheaper smartphones, and it costs $33. I'm a proud backer of this product, so I'm very happy to say that I helped a little in making this real. Um, and well, But the price is not there where we want it. Uh, we need to get it a little cheaper for decent home automation. So uh, MicroPython fits in 265k of a code base. So code space, so you can run it on tinier devices than this ARM chip and you get around with about 16K of RAM. Uh, MicroPython comes with a small file system, so you have your Python scripts just in there. You can put that on the device with a serial console or um, via other methods when flashing it. And you, the device, when it boots up, it's first in a boot.py, it runs the boot.py script, and then afterwards the main.py. 
and in the main.py you would find your general source code you would use to do stuff with the device, switching things on and off, so stuff like that. And of course you can include other libs that other people provide you with, which is very practical because you don't want to write all the code yourself. So how it works is you would import PyB, which is the base Python library for the Py board. You would then use the let object from this library and say, well, the let number one, I want to turn it on. That's all there is to it. And you maybe want to get some debug output uh, via the serial control uh, console, which you can connect your computer via USB to and see what's going on the, on the device. The machine library does a similar thing, is the more general one. Uh, you import the pin and you say, well, the pin, which is labeled x1, I want to define that's my output pin for some signal I want to send through that. And then I can say, well, I want to toggle this with p high, so I send three, the signal voltage of the chip is normally 3.3 volts, something like that. Um, I send that to the pin and then I turn it low again. So that's a very crude, simple example, of course. You have a normal list to a function, so you can see what files are in your tiny file system. You have a get current working directory. You can browse through that. You can read data. You can write data, etc. So you can you can connect to this little tiny Pi B board. There's a actually there's a SD card slot to it where you can write data to. You can lock data to. You can write data from. Read data from, etc. And if that's there, yeah, and uh, you have a serial prompt on the Pi board, which enables you to uh, basically try the stuff out uh, and see if your basic commands work. You have, and then you have normal integers and even very big numbers, which is hard to do in C. Uh, you have floating points, you have complex numbers you can calculate with and stuff like that. So it's rather neat for a tiny system like this. And if even that's not enough for you, you even can directly code assembler in Python. <laughs> so you would decorate a function to be assembler code and then you have the basic methods your assembler provides you with. Uh, so you call it then with the assembler function and that's it. The assembler code is run in this decorated function. So, the PyBot was nice, but it's not cheap enough to put it everywhere. So that's why there's a second Kickstarter. In 2016, Damien George did a second Kickstarter. It was software only. And he ported Py, Py, uh, MicroPython to the ESP8266. The ESP8266 is this tiny little uh, chip here. It normally comes on these, uh, yeah, little wafers where you have the GPI opens uh, broken out. You have a little flash chip and an antenna and it talks Wi-Fi. So it's Wi-Fi enabled. You connect this to your local home network. You can flash it with MicroPython. It has 32-bit uh, system on it with 80 megahertz. You can change the uh, speed of it a little. You can run it faster than that, but 80 megahertz is usually fine. It has 16 GPIO pins and one 10-bit analog digital converter. So you're not going to be very happy if you're used to Arduinos with Atemegas and a lot of analog digital converters, but if you use digital sensors, this thing is perfectly fine. And it's the best key feature is it's really cheap. It costs about $2, so you can put it everywhere. Uh, I'll answer questions later. So there are several versions of it. There's the ESP12. So this was the ESP03, I think. Um, th there's the ESP12, the ESP12e, which has a little more flash memory. And then there's the version with the better antenna, and so on, and so on, and so forth. But to y y really use it practically, you would use it on a dev board, which are these here. These are this tiny little devices, there's the module on it, and it provides a serial connection and a power regulation unit, so you can plug it in in a 5-volt uh, 
outlet, connect it to a micro USB port, and power this thing up. And then you have all the GPIO pins broken out, so you can directly connect a cheap sensor to it. This runs on 5 volt and costs $4. And it runs MicroPython. So now we have sensors everywhere. We have a $4 device which we can put in every corner of our house and measure data we need. So we add a DH222, for example, which is this device here. That's a temperature and humidity sensor, a digital one. So you can connect the pin 3 to any data port on the Node MCU and you're in business. We connect this like this, really simple. The one is the power for the digital temperature and humidity sensor, which we connect up to the 3.3 volts from the Node MCU. So the power regulation unit on this board gives us the 3.3 volts we need. The two is the data pin. We connect that to one of our data pins. The four is ground and the three is not connected. That's it. And here's the Python code for it. We have an import of the machine library we need, which provides us with all the interface to define the pins and the in and output and stuff like that. We have the library for the DHT, which someone kindly provided. We have the time library, we have the JSON library and the math library. We will get to that later. And we later import some more stuff we need. But the crude setup is this. So we initialize our DH222 in the D variable. Uh, we say, well, we want to run this on pin 5. And then we say, OK, we maybe have a, a let for some kind of status. And we define this as machine pin out. That's it. So we send signals to the, pin, to the, uh, to the let. With value 0, we turn it off, basically. And then with uh, while true, we enter the infinite loop we know from Arduinos. So the while loop that runs on Arduinos in an infinite loop to do the stuff all the time over and over and over and over again, we do in Python as well. So while true, that's always, that's forever, we measure, we try to measure something from our DHT222. And there's a rather grumpy device, so sometimes it, it fails and gives weird data and an exception uh, is thrown, but in Python we can handle this nicely. We have, we, we try um, to read something, and if an exception is thrown, we print it out to serial, which is normally ignored, and then we try to read it again. That's it. Oh, sorry. So we are still in the loop, and now we, we have the data. We read from the DH222, we read the temperature, and then we round it a little with our math function. We get the rounded nicer value, and then we try to format it a little nicer so we don't uh, send two crude signals through our network, uh, we format it in JSON. So we put basically just the temperature in, in the data blob for the temperature and the humidity in the data blob for the humidity. And then we send it via the network. Because we are network enabled, we can now send it via the network. And for that, we are going to use MQTT. MQTT is a standard we are going to have a look on the next slide for, but we include the library we need. We specify a topic for that. We have a unique device ID. Otherwise, we would not know which sensor senses what. Then we connect our client to our MQTT server. And then we try again to connect to the server and publish our topics and then disconnect. If the connection doesn't work, we try again after we sleep 60 seconds. After the 60 seconds, we read again our data we have and publish it again on the network. That's it. We have a network connected temperature and humidity sensor that runs Python. So uh, the MQTT part is MQTT is a message protocol that is designed for telemetry data. So it's designed for networks where you have low bandwidth and maybe unreliable connections. Um, it's an ISO standard, so there are many libraries that support you with a functioning uh, library. You can 
and it, it's, it has a subscribe and publish concept. So you subscribe to a topic you're interested in and you just get the information on that topic. If you are a tiny little sensor that runs MicroPython and sleeps for 60 seconds in a minute, for example, you just publish to one topic and then go to sleep and not bother because the broker will handle all the stuff for you. So a, a topic looks like this. So you generally have a schema like this. So a location, a device and the sensor data you read. So in our case, that would be, for example, home and then living room and then maybe a device ID that is unique to your sensor and then the temperature data. And in this, our JSON data lived with the temperature we measured. There's a last will and testament. That's a neat feature uh, which allows the device to tell the broker, in case I disconnect from your, you without telling you about it, I want you to publish this message. So the sensor goes offline without the broker being notified before it, and the, the broker knows, okay, the device disconnected, so I'm publishing to everyone who is on this topic, the device disconnected unexpectedly, for example. Uh, there's a tiny quality of service thing, which is basically three levels. The zero level means that the device is just publishing uh, the data it has, and that you might not get what was published. The one level says that the broker confirms that your message was received, and the two means that the device acknowledges the confirmation and so that you get the message exactly once and not more and not less. For simple temperature and humidity, normally the zero is fine. And then there are retained messages, which is another nice feature of MQTT. So you have a sensor that is run on battery, for example. And it sleeps about 10 minutes or maybe 20 minutes or maybe four hours because you wanted to run 10 years. Um, all, every four hours it measures something and sends it to the, to the network. If the retain flag is set, this message is retained in the broker. And if some client that is interested in this topic and wants to read the sensor data, but the device is offline and didn't publish in the last two hours, it gets this retained message. So you get an actual status of the last known value. So with MQTT, we can now switch stuff as well. We, have a, we can do a bi-directional communication between devices. So our tiny little sensor could listen to a topic that it's interested in and react on that. Um, so our device subscribes to a topic and it publishes its known state. So that's what we do. We connect, uh, that's a wall plug, you can fiddle around in yourself. Um, so how, I'm not going to provide you the details. If you're not comfortable running 230 volts, uh, and, and switching that, you should not do it. It, it can kill you. So be very careful. Uh, so the power up here runs to the, this power unit here, which powers the node MCU. And in case the node MCU decides, well, I was switched, I got network data that said to me, please switch the, the wall plug. It connects to the relay, says, well, relay, please turn on. And the power is passed on to the outlet. And there's a little uh, button here to manually switch it as well, because you want to not be only able to switch it via your network and the website and stuff like that. Um, so that was my prototype. It works, but it's probably not the cheapest option. Cheaper would be to get you something like this. Uh, that's a Sonoff, uh, which costs around six dollars, maybe ten. It is a hackable. Uh, mains power switch, there's a relay here, and there's a ESP8266 on the back. So, this means we can hack this thing. We can put MicroPython on it. We have, a, we have here, I already soldered in the uh, connection ports to connect this thing to a serial uh, converter, and then you can flash your own firmware onto this. So you buy a $6 device, 
you flash your own firmware and now you're able to communicate with MQTT or whatever you like. You can put a little web server on this and make the switch uh, do whatever you want. There are, even, uh, there are many alternative firmwares for this out there. You pick your poison. So, really addictive. Um, if you're not going to switch all, uh, or make all the devices yourself, well then the next part of the talk is for you because uh, you want something that integrates with a lot of other stuff. And you're not going to switch your self-made plugs, you want to do more. And usually you can buy a lot of cheap and good and reliable and more expensive and all kinds of different home automation tools. And I'm going to get into what, I, uh, what my approach to smart home is. So uh, it should be non-disruptive. So you shouldn't even notice that it's there. If someone needs a lecture on how to use your light switches, you have failed. So there, sh there must be a no handbook approach. You need to switch the light switches that, like you're used to. And the technology is tiny enough that you can put it hidden somewhere and it can run in the background. It should fail gracefully, which by I mean that if one device fails, it shouldn't take everything else down. Um, if the central control is down, it should work also. So if your intelligent smart home solution is down, it should not hinder you from switching your lights. And we need a high women's acceptance factor. You're not going to live alone. And if your wife is not able to switch your lights, you're having problems. <laughs> um, yeah. So what should the home automation do? In my case, it, uh, it's rather simple because I'm not very far yet. I have uh, a flat which I did not build from scratch and put all the cables in myself and stuff like that. So I have not a, a, a solution where the serial uh, comes running all through the house. So I want to be able to switch lights. I basically achieved that with the self-built MicroPython part. I want to control heating. That's the part where you need additional hardware. And maybe your home wants to know or needs to know when you're home, so you need to track that. And then we need sensors for doors so that we can automate stuff and temperature and wind and maybe power sensors are nice as well. So why do we want a free and libre open source solution or software? We don't want vendor lock-in. So if I decide to buy another smart plug the next time around because it's cheaper or it fits my needs more, uh, more uh, I don't want the vendor to say, well, we are turning off our service and you basically get an update uh, over the air that breaks your smart plug. It's not nice. Uh, I want to be able to integrate whatever device I have or I built myself and I want to connect it to my home. I want it to be explorable and adaptable, so I want a central solution to be uh, as, mm, well, moldable as I, I need it to. So if I need to get deep down to change something that I want to have fixed, I can do that. I want to control my own data. The home automation knows everything about you. It knows when you're home, when you switched what light, when you went to bed, when you came home, when you, what your normal working hours are, etc. I don't want this data to be somewhere. I want to control it, I want to have it locally, in my case. But I want to be able to control this data. I want no cloud. If a cloud service is down, I want to be able to switch my lights. And that's not that far-fetched. So, if this then that is a web service, and if, you, if the Amazon uh, web service is down, you don't switch your lights anymore. Well, <laughs> so, and there's, not, there's not the only service. There are other services that, who needs lights? I also want to be able to use this without one device I need, probably. So if I have one phone, 
I want to be able to switch my lights when I lose that or break that phone or drop it in the toilet. It, it needs to work. And of course, you have to be careful of what kind of devices you put in your home. If you have an Amazon Echo or a Google Assistant or stuff like that, it listens to you, it gets your data. So watch out if you get the Echo Look, which is the new device they announced. Um, this tells you how good you look in that dress. Um, it saves this data indefinitely. So I want to, my smart home to integrate that in a better way. So I looked at uh, some solutions. There's FEM, there's OpenHab, which is written in Java, and FEM is written in Perl. And I looked at Home Assistant, which is in, uh, written in Python 3. And that's our poison. So we're looking at Home Assistant, as you guessed probably. OK, uh, what are the arguments for Home Assistant? It's open source. That's our main goal. Uh, there's a very active community. If you have an open source software that is very complex and you don't know how to use it, it's useless. You need to be able to ask people how they do their stuff. And the active community is very helpful. So they have chat rooms and forums and video tutorials. There's a Reddit chat, etc. So you have really a wide variety of ways to get in touch with people who use Home Assistant. And they're very helpful to noobs. So if, you, um, if you're new to Home Assistant, don't uh, hesitate in asking them how to, do, uh, how to get around. There's a two-week release cycle which tells me basically that I have to update my home assistant. Um, it, it's really quick. So the, the dot releases are probably more than bi-weekly, and the 0.x releases are bi-weekly. So you get new features every two weeks. Uh, there's a, basically, you don't have to write code. You can configure it completely with the configuration scripts, or configuration file, files more accurately. Um, so you don't have to code if you don't want to. There are plenty of ways to automate stuff. It's cross-platform, so you can run it on any device basically you want to. So it runs on Windows, on Mac, on, on Linux, on a Raspberry Pi in my case. Uh, there are many, 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 many supported IoT devices you can connect it to. So there's a, a really, probably there's not a device out there you can buy that not some guy already tried to connect it to Home Assistant. It's pretty. It's a big feature. If you have seen how user interfaces look sometimes uh, on these kind of systems, this is a big, big point in the women's acceptance factor. Uh, also, I like to use it. So I like to look at my phone and use the user interface because it's so nice. <laughs> You can run Home Assistant locally or remote, so you don't have to run it on a local device in your home. If you don't want to, you can use your web server. Why not? But it's your machine. It's not someone else's cloud device that may be or may not be switched off. And cost is a big factor. Um, if you're running a more expensive home automation system, and then you probably made the investment. But if you try to take it slow and maybe try to get devices that you can connect cheaply and you buy, we have one week where you buy some smart lights and the other week you buy some smart plugs and then you maybe try to automate your heating, then cost is the most important factor because you can now integrate a, a new system that maybe came out the last two weeks and you can integrate it there and it's cheaper than the more expensive one you maybe planned on buying a year ago. So you can really be adaptive and get the hardware you want and fits your suits. So some, uh, something on the wording. So platforms are basically the main type of components. So that's maybe a light or a sensor or a cover would be a garage door, or something that goes up and down like a window, stuff like that that has a status in between. And then there's components, which are the concrete instances of, of these things, like a Hue would be the Philips version of a light, and a Drought Free would be the IKEA version of a light, and stuff like that. And they have all different APIs, so Home Assistant does that in the background, but you configure them based on their names here. So uh, 
the configuration basically starts like this. It, mine is way longer, maybe a few hundred lines of, of code, may, maybe a thousand. Uh, so you have Home Assistant, that's a YAML file. Uh, you have Home Assistant as your main component. Then you define some name for your home. Then define your latitude and longitude, where you live. Why is that important? Because Home Assistant knows when the sun is up and down. So it can, you can do basic automations based on where the sun is. Uh, you can use, of course, metric. Uh, you pick your time zone, stuff like that. And then you can include from other YAML files as well. And then the list goes on with different automations, uh, configurations. So there are currently over 600 components, which are the basic uh, APIs that Home Assistant can use. There's MQTT, we talked about that. There's Z-Wave, Zigbee, which are, uh, Zigbee is the standard where Philips Hue lights are, are based on. Um, there's also the Draft Free and the Lightify and stuff like that. Z-Wave is another home automation standard. Um, there's, there's any uh, M, M, N, no, K and X as well. So that's supported as well. There's uh, multimedia support, so you can put uh, your multimedia center uh, in your home automation, so you can trigger certain time of day, you can put the news on or stuff like that. So that's Plex and Sonos and Kodi and stuff. Uh, lights, different types of lights you can control with that. There's presence detection, which is nice. So now our home knows we are home. You, you can turn the lights on. If, it, if the sun is down and you're home, you turn the lights on. Uh, that's done by OnTracks, for example, or, or you check if your phone is connected to a local Wi-Fi. There's different hundreds of sensor possibilities and the list goes on. So let's have a quick look-see on what I can show you. Um, we have Okay, so we probably need to start this up first. Um, we have a local instance of HES running. So um, HES has a basic user interface, which is, which is uh, just a website. And this is done really nice. So you can connect, connect from your phone and it looks good. You can connect from your desktop and it looks good. So this would be an out-of-the-box home assistant with the demo flag turned on. Um, so you get a welcome screen. And then you have stuff like basic sensors. So the sun is up now and uh, there have been movement in the backyard because you have a motion sensor there, for example. Then you want to turn the lights off in the kitchen. In the kitchen, we don't need that. Um, we have ceiling lights in the living room, stuff like that. We can turn the air conditioning on off. We have integration to our multimedia players. We have uh, a calendar events we can integrate. Uh, we can group these devices. So uh, here we group kitchen, here we group bedroom, here we group living room, and then we can even put them in a separate tab up here if you want to. And that's downstairs, for example, where we don't need air conditioning, stuff like that. So uh, let's have a look at the, at the configuration part here. So here, you, so this is rather new to Home Assistant. Um, you can do some type, uh, some sort of configuration in the web front end, but mostly you do the stuff in the YAML files, which I described earlier. Um, so, and here you can restart your server, etc. cetera. Um, you have a list of the devices you connected to here. So you would take the ID of the device from here. So if we go to, let's say, some light. So we have a ceiling light, for example. Uh, we would take this ID, put it in the YAML file and do something to it. So turn it off, turn it on, uh, kind of uh, stuff for Automations. Okay. Um, 
let's have a look if I can show you my actual setup. Okay. Um, whoop. So let's go here. So that's my actual setup at home. So I'm not home at the moment. Uh, that's the view from my balcony. That's my living room, so I can switch this lamp on. Uh, there's a light in the, in the child's room as well. I see what the temperature is in the living room right now. I have a basic history of that that's not very useful. Uh, maybe the, <laughs> maybe this, the outside temperature is better because there's no change. So you see it was rather cold, three degrees in, during the night. Um, so you could then basically say, well, automate an automation that says, well, last night was rather cold, maybe put your plants in or stuff like that. Uh, so I've, uh, yes, so that's basically the user phase what I wanted to show you. I think uh, time is rather close, so I think we switch back to the main. So I, what I have here up there, you can customize uh, so-called material design icons to be in the tabs here. So I have uh, here a tab for all the sensor data. So living room, uh, on the lodge I have a, a fine dust sensor as well, which is uh, recording the fine dust levels in graphs and it's actually publishing it to uh, luft.info, so if you're interested. So um, let's get back to the talk. Um, so that's the demo. So um, you can now track with uh, location-based data from your Wi-Fi access point. Your home assistant knows you're here. Um, you can, with um, own tracks, you can track where you are in the world, and you can bro broadcast that back home. So my home assistant knows when I'm at work. So you can do very nice automation with that. So if you say uh, leave work in a defined time frame, then Assumptions are you're coming home, so maybe turn the heating on or stuff like that. So my use cases are is detect when I'm home, I switch lights, automated as well, so when I come home I say turn the lights on. Or I, I switch lights by scene, so if I want to watch TV I know these lights and these lights are off, definitely, because I don't see anything else on the screen. Uh, and these lights are on because some ambient light is nice. And then maybe notify me when a bulb is broken. So, welcome home, Florian. That's what your wife is doing. Huh? That's usually your wife is telling you before every, it's broken. Think yes, it's yes, broken. no, but uh, I, I'm going to this. <laughs> I'm going to this in a minute. So, home assistant greets me when I'm coming home. That's more kind of a debug message. <laughs> 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 but if it bro Bulb is broken, that's nice to know, isn't it? So I have a, a living room light which has four separate bulbs and they are put on a, on a smart Z-Wave uh, relay. And what this does is it goes in the wall, so it's hidden, no one knows it's there. You switch it with a normal light switch. The state is published to Home Assistant it publishes what power is used in Home Assistant, to Home Assistant, um, and then it can notify me if the power changes. So if I turn it on, I'm coming to the automation in a moment, but to notify me, I'm using uh, XMPP or Java, and that's basically the configuration you need. You set up a, a Java account for your Home Assistant, you set up which um, Java account you want to notify, and that's it. So let's go to the automation. So that's the, the wall plug, that's Z-Wave, it's a Fibaro relay, which is a nice thing. It has actually two relays in there. You can switch two circuits separately. And the automation looks like this. That's a, a simplification a little bit. I have more captures in there, but that's the gist. So you have an automation, that's a YAML file, as we know it from earlier. There's an al alias for that, so that's the name of it. And then we have a trigger, so when should the automation fire? It should fire when your Fibaro relay light switch, that's the name of, the, it's even longer than that actually, um, turns on. 
So every time I turn the light on, I'll fire the automation and check. Under the condition that the wattage, so the relay, the relay power we get from our sensor that is in this device, is below 145 watts, so normally it runs around 150, and above 2, because it takes about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 watts to run itself. In that case, do the action. And the action is notify via Jabber title, that's a shorter thing. I put in there what kind of bulb I need to buy. So in case I'm not home, I get the notification, I can buy the bulb directly. Um, so look out for security. There is uh, a lot of devices out there that don't work as nicely as you would expect and that broadcast home something. So uh, there's a link to uh, an IKEA drug-free uh, review. They did it really nicely. There's a, there's a new uh, standard based on uh, Zigbee as well as the Hue-like bulbs, but they are not using anything that communicates in a cloud how your light statuses are, and they don't need a cloud to do that, and it's already, already integrated in Home Assistant. Uh, so they are doing it correctly. So your light does not broadcast, well, look who's home. So um, have a look out for that. And uh, thank you for your attention. I think, I think we have about three minutes for questions. So if you'll be quick. Yeah. Open Hub? Yeah. No, I did not. I didn't get around to installing it. And uh, I'm glad I did not try it. That, just I was because I, I started with OpenHP. Yes. Uh, uh, no, I did not try Open Hub. Yeah, no, I have not tried it. Um, I'm, I'm quite happy with Home Assistant. And uh, regarding the speed of the development of the platform, it's really nice. So a little anecdote. Um, the Home Assistant guys already had a library for the drought-free thing, which has no public API yet. They had a library working with the drought-free thing when the OpenHab guys thought, should they reverse engineer it? So they're really quick. Any other questions? Uh, can you explain us a bit about the underlying technology in this OpenHP web server, for example? Oh, Home Assistant. Yeah. You mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Home Assistant, it runs on... Uh, Yes, Python 3, but the web technology is, ah, that's a good question. No, 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 it, that's, I think it's, it's uh, wait a second, I can't, um, I'm missing the, the library they use for JavaScript interactions, I, I, I can't tell you. No, I don't know, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm just missing the, the word. Huh? No, I don't think so. No, it's not Angular. It's not React. It's not Angular. It's it's something else. I'm, I'm no, I don't know. Any other questions? I try to get hands on the USB. Yes. Really? Uh, so I have the so the the question was it's really hard to get these devices. Um, I to get these cheap prices you have to buy them from China directly. So, and then you wait, you wait a month. I mean, you wait a month, then it's not hard to get because you just order by clicking. And if you, exactly. uh, if you have a credit card and no English language, then it's not a problem to buy everything from China. Because, it, it, I mean, if you buy it from the US or from China, it's, it's far away. So, well, whether or not it was So, it takes quite a lot of time to, to, to uh, order it from China. You can get uh, it. Uh, I ordered the first one in a store in Vienna. But they had rather horrendous shipping costs, so I asked a friend to pick it up. Uh, but then you get it for 10 bucks. So it costs 10 euros to get this one in Austria. So, yeah. Yeah? Three and a half dollars from China. Yeah. Which network interfaces? Um, I think this connects to AGN. I'm not, no. I think it's N, I think it supports, I'm not sure. 
So it's a normal Wi-Fi device. Uh, the best part about it, uh, MicroPython actually has a web wrapper for it. So if, you, if you're running MicroPython on this, you can connect to a web server that gives you a live Python wrapper. So this, uh, this uh, uh, evaluating print loop, so where you put all your Python commands in, you get that on a website with this. And it runs he on here. Uh, I haven't measured it. I don't know the power consumption of this thing, no. But you can put it in a deep sleep, which, is, which puts it in rather lower uh, settings. Yes, that, this, has a, this has a power, power uh, regulation unit on it, which uh, uses more power than if you run the micro thingy itself on the batteries. So if you want to run on batteries and want to run it long time, you need to use the, just a tiny element and do the power stuff yourself. And then if you put it in deep sleep, it takes micro amperes or something like that. So really tiny. And then basically all it does is wake up at a certain time and then run through your Python script again. So thank you very much. That's it.